In 1984, the United Farm Workers Union called for a consumer boycott of table grapes. Cesar Chavez is in New York, the world's largest consumer of grapes, to continue that crusade and speak about the dangers of pesticides. It is a cause he risked his life for during a 36-day hunger strike in 1988, and we're pleased to have him here to talk about his politics and his protest and his life. Welcome. Thank you. Good to have you here. Uh, tell me what you hope to accomplish. I mean, it's been on seven long years for you. And a, and a lifetime devoted well, to farm workers. Well, this is our third boycott of grapes. Right. Uh, we won in two previous occasions. One took five and a half years the first time, and three and a half the second time. Uh, it's taken a long time because we discontinued boycotting. We had a sort of a organization out there, and we gave it up right. when we were covered under the under the uh, state agricultural workers uh, agricultural labor relations act, right. which didn't work for us after all, and so. We got to build that organization so we can win the boycott. But it, we're we're very far along. And, we, and to win means what? To win means get the growers to the bargaining table mm -hmm. and deal with the issue of pesticides as we've done before. We want the the pesticides that are causing the big problems with cancer and birth defects yeah. eliminated. We like very much to have the whole thing turn into some uh, turn grapes, uh, have them raise the grapes naturally. We could. Yeah. And, and what uh, do the growers say to that? that, that oh, it, well, they're saying what they, they said. They can't survive economically if they <clears throat> can't use pesticides. Very. In 1965, we made a demand that they stop using DDT, and we were told they wouldn't because they couldn't hope to raise grapes without DDT. They did in 1970 when we beat them. We were able to eliminate DDT, DDE, Aldrin, the Aldrin, all those hard mm -hmm. pesticides, and I think we'll do it again. And we're, we're pretty close getting there. And, and what will it take to get you there? Um, We've got to cut, cut the sales by about 9%. Mm -hmm. I think that'll be enough to get them to the table. And we're somewhere, I think, past five. And it's, the boycotts have a way of developing their own life, their own existence. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's getting, we feel, we see a lot of, a lot of uh, signs now that we've experienced from the other boycotts. So it looks pretty good. We're very yeah. hopeful. You have seen a lot of change, I suspect, in the life of uh, farm workers since you have been at the head of the parade in their crusade? Well, certainly we have seen some very big changes, good changes and very bad changes for us. What's the bad change? Well, remember, we um, started under a Republican administration in California, and then we the had... Reagan that, administration. Right. We had eight years of a very good administration under Brown. We made a lot of progress. And then we had uh, Doug Majan that almost destroyed our union, and now we have Wilson continuing the same thing. So we've seen both, and we see what happens you know, when we have yeah. a friendly administration. It's, is it dramatically different when you're not operating in the full glare of publicity and public attention and when you're not being wined and dined uh, in, in, you know, some of the, by, by liberal supporters? Well, we have to understand the work it's has to be It's almost like you're operating more obscurity today than you have in the past. Actually, not really. But it's, see, it's, uh, in those cases, we just want costs. Now we're one of many causes. Right. But actually, we have more support today. Uh, we're in more areas. We have more committees than we had before. But it appears that way because in those days, we were for a while just one, one yeah. big cause. And now we're part of many. Yeah. How have you changed in your outlook? Uh, what have you learned in these years? Oh, a lot. I've learned that in our work, in, in the issue of the environment, the issue of... Uh, uh, pesticides and the issue of you know, protecting workers on the job site, that we really cannot hope for any action from government. That if it's going to be done, it has to be done uh, at, the, at the marketplace. Uh, pub, uh, public action is going to be where we're going to see some results. And that's been, the, that's been the history of the union for 30 years. You can't hurt them in the pocketbook. You can't hurt them. We can't hope. Uh, we don't have the money, the influence, the political power because most of our workers are not even citizens. So we can't hope to influence politicians. The, the agricultural uh, lobby is extremely uh, effective and powerful, and we have the chemical industry and the oil industry all involved in one. It's very difficult for us. We have to go to the marketplace and then take them on there, and, and we've been able to beat them before, and we, I think we'll do it again. Yeah. Tell me about Fred Ross. Great friend. We miss him a lot. Fred uh, took me out of the fields many years ago and, and gave me a chance to become an organizer. He, he, uh, 
What do you see in you? I don't know. I, he thought I could do it and, and gave me a chance, and I learned a lot under him. I became a community organizer before I became a labor organizer, but it was Fred who gave me that chance and got me started. Of course, many things happened after that. Gave your life purpose and direction and... Direction and understanding. Uh, uh, he had a keen sense of how to create power, how to move things, how to get people excited, how to lead, and, well, a whole bunch of things that makes up the life of an organizer. And then putting all that together to some useful purpose. And so um, we'll, we'll, yeah, we won't, yeah. we'll remember for a long time to come. If you, if you don't make it for some reason, which you clearly not, uh, uh, you seem healthy and, and uh, full of energy, what would you be most proud of and what would you feel most unhappy about not accomplishing? Well, if I don't make it personally, somebody else will. I'm pretty sure of that. Um, I think what we've, we've done more than anything else, we've been able to get consumers to understand the dangers of pesticides. We've been able to get the public to understand that the workers who produce the food are the ones that really suffer the impact of those pesticides. And above all, we've been able to get a large part of Americans to understand that there are severe problems with the men, women, and children who work in the fields that produce the food we eat. And what about <coughs> dignity for those workers? Some cases, yes. Uh, although but other cases, not. Not. In those cases where they've been able to be successful in their own union, a lot of dignity, a lot of, a lot of uh, better wages and conditions, and the things mm -hmm. that go with having a union. But unfortunately, a small number of them still yet many, many people uh, need to be helped. What, if, what do you say to those who would look at you and say, uh, you have been dedicated enough to engage in a fast uh, and risk your life? But the causes that you so dream about are the causes of the 60s and the causes of, of the 70s, and they're not rallying cries in the 90s. Well, no. Uh, the environment is a rallying cry today more. We were involved in the environment back in beginning in the mid-50s. We're still involved pretty much. So that's a rallying cry today. The issue of human dignity is pretty much an issue today. We're involved in the in the issues of human beings. So they're not past, they're present, and yeah. they're pretty When you pretty fasted, real. did you think you were going to die? No. Why not? We don't know enough about fasting to know that um, uh, if I followed the, the prescribed course that I set for myself, and I've read enough about um, other fasts, that if I took care of myself, I shouldn't. And yeah. I, of course, Who was your inspiration when you did that? Well, I look forward to, you know, uh, oddly enough, yeah. uh, Gandhi, but also, people don't know, Irish. Irish folks fast, and we, we had this fast from the guys, that folks that died some years back in prison. Um, I learned a lot. I learned the, none of them died before the 48th day. No Several one died days. in a fast before the 48th day. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the experience we had from the yeah. people in Ireland. Uh, a lot of, a lot of, um, from Gandhi, who did a lot of research on fasting and knew what had to happen to be able to protect himself as he was fasting. So, and then, and then um, from um, my other fast that I've done. Yeah. yeah. Thirty-six day, you were near death, though, weren't you? I got very weak at the end, you know. Do, and, what does but, your mind do to you? Oh, it's clear. It's clear. Oh, fasting after about after you stop eating for six, seven days. You begin to not be afraid of anything. By the time you get to 15 days, you're not afraid of even death itself. It's very interesting. Um, you're able to see things that you can't see or hear when you're eating. Like the what? Eating. You see other people eating. Yeah. And it becomes, on every day, if you see them eating every day and you're eating, you don't see how single-mindedness it is. People eat, and they put every single uh, piece of their being attention to eating, it's a, so, I mean, it's completely focused. You can't see that unless you're not eating, as an example. Your senses um, get very strong. You can hear things uh, that, you, that normally you can't, where you can't while you're eating. Do you sleep well? Really? No, maybe an hour every 24 hours. Is that right? Mm -hmm. You don't Almost sleep? Almost no sleep, no. Almost 